This is CBC Here and Now. It's an unbelievable and horrific incident investigated by the child advocate. When I became aware of this case and the details, I was incredibly saddened. A 12-year-old girl repeatedly sexually assaulted by her stepfather gets an abortion at Eastern Health and walks out with her abuser. No one raised alarm bells. I felt sick to my stomach. I felt really sad and disappointed. This case is, is truly disturbing and horrific, um, but it's not surprising and it's not shocking uh, to me. But this story is shocking to many. Today, the province's child and youth advocate released details of the sexual abuse of a 12-year-old girl and the failure of authorities to protect her. Here and now's Mark Quinn reports. It's a heartbreaking case of a 12-year-old girl who was sexually abused by her stepfather. When he brought her to the hospital for an abortion, she left with him. The child advocate says this never should have happened. Assessments weren't completed, screening wasn't done, supports and follow-up weren't provided, consents weren't uh, in place appropriately, um, and the professionals involved were not aware of the relevant legislation. So if you define that as failure, I think there's probably a failure. Lake Cavanaugh says the girl shouldn't have been treated like an adult and she shouldn't have been sent home with the man who sexually assaulted her. But it gets even worse. After the child and her stepfather left the province, he continued to rape her. Eventually, after she had a second abortion, she reported what her stepfather did to authorities. The child advocate sees a lot of tragedy, but still, she says it was difficult for her to learn of these horrendous details. I was incredibly saddened and shocked as well that this series of events could unfold and this kind of a response could be provided to this little 12-year-old girl. The advocate says she's looking for professionals to act differently when a 12-year-old girl comes in looking for an abortion, treating her like a child and possibly a victim instead of an adult. The health minister is out of the province and unavailable for an interview. Eastern Health was also asked to respond to the child advocate's findings, but no one was available for an interview there either. As far as we know, no one's been held accountable, disciplined or fired for what happened. On Twitter, the reaction to this case has been swift. People are saying it's not just heartbreaking, it's outrageous. The stepfather in this case was charged and convicted in another province. The child advocate hopes her recommendations mean this will never happen to another child in this province again. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And as Mark just said, the stepfather of the girl was charged and convicted for sexually assaulting her and others. He received a 16-year prison sentence. And we have an update on this story. Late this afternoon, Eastern Health released a statement to CBC. In it, the authority said it is deeply saddened by the experience described in the report and welcomes the recommendations. It goes on to say they acknowledge their role in the situation and the impact it had on the child involved. Eastern Health says it's developed an action plan to implement these recommendations and work in close collaboration with its partners. And it says identifying children who are at risk is critically important. And Eastern Health recognizes that they have a crucial role to play in their health, safety and well-being. Now, just a couple of hours ago, I sat down with St. John's lawyer Lynn Moore practicing in childhood sexual abuse cases. Lynn, thank you very much for joining me here today. Now, the child youth advocate says this is an absolutely horrific case. Uh, the entire system let this girl down. How disturbing is this case to you? Well, this case is, is truly disturbing and horrific, um, but it's not surprising and it's not shocking uh, to me. It's the um, bread and butter of my work is dealing with people who have survived childhood sexual assault. And I'm not surprised that it's still happening, that it's current, because as a society, we're not really doing anything to prevent it. Well, I want to talk about how this still continues. Um, there were multiple uh, opportunities to intervene in this particular case for this girl and for her siblings, but they were somehow missed. I mean, how can this happen? 
Well, it happens because we have a system that is severely underfunded when it comes to protecting children. Um, what should have happened in this case is that the doctor should have made a referral to uh, a social worker who works with child and youth protection, and the social worker should then have done an investigation. Um, the child gave a, a false father to the, the named a false father to the doctor, and that should they should have spoken to the person who was supposedly the father, the boy, if it was a boyfriend. And they should have provided her with counseling because uh, if a 12 year old is pregnant, then that's a pretty serious situation that requires some outside help. They should have developed a relationship with her so that she felt comfortable enough to disclose what was happening to her. There should have been a wraparound of supports, not just a provision of a medical service. Well, as you said at the beginning, you're not surprised. You see these kinds of cases, and we've heard about cases over the years, time and time again, young people being raped, sexually abused, particularly girls, um, yet it does continue. I don't really understand why. It continues because we're not talking about it as a society. We don't talk about sexual assault in our schools. We don't teach our children about consent. We don't teach our children about healthy sexual expression. We don't teach them, therefore, the corollary of unhealthy sexual expression, things that, that happen that shouldn't happen. And you know, we, we need to uh, address that. We need to change our education system. The, the Department of Education came out the other day and they're looking at new curriculum outcomes. And for some reason, you know, math is very, very important to the people who decide what goes on in education, but how we relate to each other, how we resolve conflict, and how we engage with each other on a consensual basis, that's not taught, and it really should be taught. That's one aspect, but you, you talked about earlier the, uh, the fact that uh, this doctor didn't do this and this uh, agency wasn't notified, but from a human perspective, why wouldn't these grown-ups do something? Well, I can understand the doctor's position. I'm sure the doctor was concerned about providing the medical service that the doctor was, was asked to provide. And from the child protection aspect, because they were involved for a period of time, and when they were involved, they did drop the ball. I think what we have there is a systemic problem. I don't think any one individual social worker is to blame for not doing his or her job properly, because I think what has happened is that those people who you know go to school and they study social work and they want to help people, that's why they're drawn to that field, they end up in a system where there are not enough hours in the day. There are significant turnover rates, there's a stress, you know, there's a significant number of people on stress leave. People cannot do the task they're given because there's just simply too much work. So Lynn, who is accountable? I mean, should heads roll somewhere within the system over this case? You know, Debbie, that's what happens usually when something goes very wrong. Uh, is that the government looks at it and says, oh yes, this is bad, we're going to fire someone over this. And what I would like to see them do is hire 400 people, uh, hire a, 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 a massive army of social workers who will help protect our children in this province. Because firing people, uh, doing it, taking it as a one-off thing, getting rid of this person, that has not worked. Our system has gone through many reviews, many inquiries, children are at risk, and they need to put some serious supports in place to protect children. In 2009, they changed the act, and they actually reduced the number of services that they provide to children, and it is completely and totally outlandish. It's scandalous. It's ridiculous. And they've changed the definition of a child in need of protection. They've removed supportive services. So that means that they're doing more and more apprehensions. They're not doing anything in terms of follow-up from the trauma of a child being removed from their home. Uh, you know, when, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you remove supportive services, the only option the social workers have is to apprehend. So, you know, to, to, to say that one person is responsible, it's a system that's responsible and the system needs to change. And this system let a 12-year-old continue to be raped for two years, to go through another abortion, to have uh, other people be victims of this man because there was no action. How does that sit with you? It's terrible, you know, it's, it's absolutely terrible. And uh, we need a government that is responsive to this problem. We need an education system that is responsive to this problem. We need a child protection system that's responsive to this problem. We need fundamental changes and I'm hopeful that they will come.
And that, of course, is lawyer Lynn Moore speaking with me late this afternoon. Yeah, in about 15 minutes, Rolanda Ryan with the Athena Center talks about the checks and balances that should be in place when a 12-year-old seeks an abortion. Now, here's what else is making news tonight. Unwelcome paramedic. People in Sheshashi don't want the Labrador Grenfell health worker in their community. The vote must go on. A request to delay municipal elections in Lab West is denied. This week or next, the ace of spades will be drawn in the ghouls. Rain continues to roll eastward across the island as we move through the next couple of days, but another nice one for tomorrow. How's this summer shaping up compared to some of the previous? We'll have a look at that coming up as well. The Shashashi Ban Council chief says a paramedic who works for Labrador Grenfell Health is no longer welcome in the First Nation community. It has to do with a widely shared video which shows the paramedic in an Innu family's home. Here now is Bailey White reports. The video shows April Pone sitting on a couch with her 11-year-old nephew and her 2-year-old daughter Edlina. Edlina is the patient and Pone says she'd been sick for four days at this point with red eyes, a fever and nausea. She says they'd been to the hospital twice that week before calling an ambulance. All right, well, let's go. Get ready. Get right ready. Do you always place people like that? <laughs> well, I mean, you have the van outside. Clinic's open all day. here. You can hear the paramedic ask Pone why she didn't go to the clinic or use the van in the driveway to drive to the hospital. Now, Pone says there are good reasons. First of all, the clinic wasn't open, and second of all, the van didn't belong to her. She says it was her mother's and that her mother arrived after she called an ambulance. Shahati Chief Eugene Hart says the paramedic is no longer welcome in the community. Why did you feel like you needed to, to kind of go that far and say, you know what, we don't want him to come back? Like, why was that important? Well, as a leader of Sheshashi, um, this is my job. This is my role, is to help people, not to put people down and not to turn away people that needs help. The paramedic works for Labrador Grenfell Health, and a spokesperson for the health authority says the incident is under review, but he wouldn't offer any specifics like whether or not the paramedic is still employed. Meanwhile, Edlina, the two-year-old, is feeling better. She's being treated with antibiotics. Bailey White, CBC News, Shajid. Residents of Labrador West will go to the polls next month. Just like all other municipalities in the province, councillors in Labrador City asked the Department of Municipal Affairs to delay voting day in their community in neighboring Wabush for up to five months. They want more time to consider the long-awaited feasibility study around amalgamation. However, the department turned the request down and the election will go ahead on September 26th. The SPCA in Cornerbrook is going through another major change. The group will take on responsibility for caring for impounded animals and will finally move into a new building. The current shelter is in deplorable shape and not up to code. Here now is Colleen Connors takes us there and explains the big change. It has been a long time coming, but the SPCA in the Cornerbrook region seems to have found a solution to its building dilemma. This very old building here, the current SPCA, well, that will be torn down. The pound in the city of Cornerbrook will close and the SPCA will get a brand new location somewhere in the city of Cornerbrook. Now, it has been a struggle to find the proper space for the SPCA to hold the cats and dogs in this area. In 2011, they purchased a full building on the North Shore Highway, but that place is just not up to code and not suitable for what they need. The city will rent that space and the unused building will be used to store off-season equipment with the city. The money will go to supporting the new facility within the city. Now, president of the SPCA, Francis Drover, is thrilled with the idea of a solution to this building dilemma. Well, I think as a board, we feel really, really good about it that all of our hours of volunteering and meetings and trying to get a new shelter seems to be closer. So right now, the city and the SPCA are looking for this brand new location. It could possibly be a new lot where they'll build a brand new building, or they may use a space that's already available within the city. It's going to take 12 to 18 months before we see this new SPCA city pound building. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. 
Last night, we told you about a proposal to build a second road leading to Signal Hill. Well, tonight, that idea has been dropped. St. John City Councilor Sandy Hickman floated the idea yesterday, saying it could be a solution to the noisy motorcycles traveling up and down Signal Hill. But Hickman now says he's no longer pushing for a feasibility study into the alternate access route. Hickman says he's unable to convey the concept clearly to the public, so he's dropping the motion altogether. Well, it's already shaping up to be a record year for the Puffin Patrol on the southern shore. Hello, little bird. Soon you will be free. Yay, we love you. The Puffin Rescue Group gathers up hundreds of baby puffins that are rescued in the nighttime. The birds become disoriented by lights and fly towards them at night, especially in the Bay Bulls Whitless Bay area. The crew has rescued over 700 puffins so far this season. People travel from all over the world to see the puffins, and now, thanks to the Puffin Patrol itself, people like Alexi Williams are also coming here to save them. I loved it here. It's it's great and I could do so much and now that I'm older I can do a lot more. So it's really great. I love saving the puffins. It's, it's really good because I feel like I'm doing something that's good for the environment. I think the message I'll bring home for the U.S. would probably be like come up and rescue the puffins. It's great. It's a good experience. And Alexi isn't the only American interested in puffins. It turns out the little fuzzy birds have also caught the interest of the big shiny stars in Hollywood and thanks to the founder of the Puffin Patrol. And later this week, we'll tell you how this former Hollywood film exec ended up here making connections and saving puffins. All right, now let's get to the story that a lot of people are talking about tonight. As much as $2 million up for grabs in the long-running Chase the Ace in the Ghoul. Two million. <laughs> people have been lining up since early this morning to get a shot at that jackpot. And have a look at how the day unfolded outside St. Kevin's Parish. It's been 44 weeks and still no one's been able to draw the winning card, the Ace of Spades, to claim the money. And that's why the prize tonight is nearly $2 million. Wow, and it also explains why this lineup seems to go on <laughs> forever. Out of the church, the parking lot, down the street, into the neighborhood, passing house after house after house. It is just amazing. And of course, right in the thick of the action today, <laughs> our Zach Gowdy, he's been in the ghouls for much of the day. He, and he's joining us now from the ghouls. So Zach, that is quite the crowd of people lining up to buy tickets. Absolutely, and as you can see, the crowds uh, just keep on coming. There are still several hundred people in line, thousands likely. Um, we can't tell you because we can't see the end of the line. I hope you can see me uh, here in the crowd. Uh, good thing that I wore this very eye-catching t-shirt. Uh, in fact, this is the t-shirt that everyone here hopes to be wearing themselves. This is reserved for the winner of Gould's Chase the Ace. Unfortunately, I have to give this back uh, because it will be at the front of the stage waiting for somebody to put it on. Will it be tonight? Will it be next week? We're all going to find out together. Uh, one thing we can say for sure, though, the crowd today has been unbelievable. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is the largest crowd yet for Chase the Ace. And, you know, that probably shouldn't be a surprise considering that word is out. Everybody knows that they have just two chances left, maybe only one chance to chase the ace. Uh, of course, as you've all heard, the reason is the start of the school year. You are looking at the parking lot for St. Kevin's Junior High School for the obvious reason. They cannot continue this event once the school year begins. And for many people, the start of the school year and ending the game early would be a mercy. We've talked about the disruption in the community of ghouls every Wednesday, the traffic. We've talked about the volunteer burnout. Many of the people inside selling tickets have been working those tables every Wednesday since last October. And there's also the risk of running a public event of this size over and over again. But you know, when I asked people today in the lineup how they felt about the game ending early, unbelievably, not everyone is ready to give up the chase. I think it's a good idea to wrap it up early, for yeah. sure. I don't know how they're going to do it exactly, but it'll be, I think it's good. they got to do something, you know, to allow the children to go to school. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Well, it's going to be gone today because I'm going to win it. Oh, yes, it's a moot, moot point. <laughs> so there you go, there's no problem there. I don't have to worry about next week, darling. <laughs> 
funny how many people keep saying that to me. Uh, stick around with us, folks. We'll be checking back in here tonight at Ghouls, meet some more of the great characters who are here at Chase the Ace. And if you can't get down here yourself, but you want to watch the action, we will be bringing you the draw on our CBCNL Facebook Live. We'll start that streaming at 8 o'clock. As soon as they stop selling tickets, then they call the 50-50, and a short time later, it's Ace time. Reporting live in Ghouls, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Coming up, the Athena Center, an abortion clinic in St. John's, weighs in on the sexual abuse case involving a 12-year-old girl who underwent an abortion with barely any questions asked. Welcome back, everyone. What a night for uh, Chase the Ace yeah. and the Ghouls. Do you have tickets? I don't. Do you? I do. You do. <laughs> do we don't. We we'll, don't. <laughs> we'll have to figure out where she's keeping them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm hoping uh, we'll go to next week. Uh, maybe I can get some tickets for next week. Uh, what an evening and what a summer it yeah. has been. Uh, think about how many Chase the Ace nights we've had. They've all been pretty much good. Yep. A couple of, uh, of wet ones. Uh, but uh, have a look at the highs today across the province. Uh, just wonderful. And you know, I'm hearing a lot, uh, Debbie and Carolyn, this has got to be the best summer ever. This has got to be the best summer. I can't remember a summer like this. Well, my response for the most part has been, well, when you look at the numbers overall, 2012 is pretty tough to beat in mm -hmm. terms of 20 degree days. But as I dug a little bit deeper over the last day or so, what set 2012 apart from the rest was 
we had a great spring. The 20 degree days started adding up early on in the spring. And then we had a couple in May, more in June, and then we had a nice fall as well. That's why the days are so high in 2012. So when I looked at 2017 versus 2012, directly talking about June 21st to August 21st, pretty similar numbers. Oh, wow. So the summer so far, of course, two months does not a summer make. We still have another month to go. Uh, it's pretty much on par, except how about those rain-free days? We've had mm -hmm. double the amount of rain-free days. Interesting to note, we've had way more precip, but more rain-free days. Of that 242 millimeters in St. John's, 60% of that has fallen on six days. So we've had a lot of rain in over a short period of time with a ton of sunny days in the mix. Now, I'm sure many of you in Western Labrador are saying, hold on, hold on, this has not been a great summer, and you would be right. Record-breaking rainfall uh, in the month of August in Lab West, topping many, many uh, August previous. Uh, 2011 was the previous record. You've smashed that record. And uh, thanks to uh, Pat Patrick uh, Duplessis, uh, who uh, posted that today on Twitter. So there you go. Lab West, a little shout out to you folks, because I knew you were screaming at the TV. And yeah, most of Labrador has certainly been damp, as it was in 2012, though 2012 was a little bit warmer. Okay, on to the present weather, which has been rolling more rain into Labrador. And we have, yes, rainfall warnings still in effect for the southwest coast, as well as special weather statements. Uh, this is the line that's been working its way in, spreading some showers up into central. It'll continue to wander eastward tonight with those steadiest rains. Labrador will actually see a bit of a break as that heaviest rain starts to move offshore. Still some lingering showers and watching this line. It extends all the way back down through the Maritimes and down into the southern U.S. And it's going to continue to move across the island uh, from basically southwest to northeast over the next few days. Tomorrow morning, best chance of some rain at times heavy will be from Port Basque up uh, likely east of Corner Brook, but through the Humber Valley, edging Grand Falls, Windsor as well. Scattered showers named back through Labrador City. Bit of a break to start the day in Happy Valley Goose Bay and Cartwright. That changes as we move into the afternoon, uh, and we can see a nice start for most of eastern Newfoundland as well. Gander gets into some showers and, and rain chances into the later parts of the afternoon. We're staying dry for the Avalon, the Buren, and Bonavista tomorrow, and we'll actually see some sunshine developing over parts of the west coast. While again, Happy Valley Goose Bay and Cartwright, while you're dry to start, you're certainly getting into those shower chances into the afternoon. Tomorrow, We'll likely break a record for August 24th. The August 24th record is around uh, 25 degrees. My forecast high is 26. So likely a record breaker for tomorrow's date in St. John's. And again, it's dry for Eastern. Those showers marching into and periods of rain marching into Central, kind of clearing out a little bit in the West, but warm temps for all. A little cooler high teens in those onshore winds along the Southwest coast were single digits in Nain tomorrow again, back to 20 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay and looking at temps into the uh, 12 to 14 degree range for Labrador City and Churchill Falls. And you note the warm up there in Southeastern parts of Labrador with that bit of a warm punch. That's not going to last. A bit of a cool down again for Friday and into the weekend. In fact, we have a cool down for most of the province for the weekend, of course. We'll talk about that with your full seven day coming up in just a few minutes. Carolyn? Thanks, Ryan. Now back to our top story. There is a lot of reaction to the report of a 12 year old girl who fell through the cracks in this province. She was sexually assaulted by her stepfather, became pregnant, got an abortion with barely any questions asked by healthcare professionals. Later, authorities outside Newfoundland learned that she had been sexually assaulted for more than two years and had a second abortion in a different province. The stepfather was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Now, this is a case Rolanda Ryan says shouldn't have been missed. She runs the Athena Center, an abortion center in St. John's. So pretty disturbing report coming from the child and youth advocate today. What did you think when you first heard about it? I'm sure my reaction was exactly the same as everybody else who heard the story. I felt sick to my stomach. I felt really sad and disappointed. How rare is it for someone that young to be seeking an abortion? It's actually quite rare, um, 
we probably see maybe certainly less than 10 women a year who are under 14 years old, most of them being 13 and 14 years old. Um, I think maybe in our history of 27 years as the freestanding abortion clinic in uh, St. John's in Newfoundland actually, we've had like one patient who was 12 years old. Really? Because it is rare for such a young girl to come through the system like this looking for an abortion, do you think that greater care should have been taken to really find out what the cause of her pregnancy was and the circumstances surrounding it? Absolutely. Uh, anybody we have that's young, you know, under 16, we go over and above trying to get as much information as we can. We And at every step, so in the counseling with the social worker, in the ultrasound room with the nurses, in the OR, at every point we're trying to get as much information because, again, under 16, you know, there's there's laws around how old you can consent. So again, the 12-year-old can consent to someone with a two-year age difference. People 14 and 15 can consent with someone with a five-year age difference, providing it's not positions of authority. So there's a lot of legislation around it and we do everything we can to try and pick out the cases where there could potentially be abuse and then we try and dig down into the details and question and you know if there's somebody with that person so even if we had somebody who was 14 in here or 15 and they were with their mother you know we'd be upstairs talking to her and chances are very high that the medical receptionist downstairs would be talking to the mom and asking questions about so do you know the boyfriend like so we're all really keen when we have somebody in who's under 16 to, to really pay attention to the details. How is it possible for any woman going through this process to not be offered counseling before or after the procedure? I can assure you that that doesn't happen here because we absolutely do counseling beforehand and get informed consent and it's at that point some women realize that they're really not ready for this decision and sometimes they leave and sometimes through the counseling even if they came in and had decided they needed to terminate a pregnancy after lengthy counseling some women change their minds and leave and continue their pregnancy. So. Counseling is super, super important. It's the point where you pick up uncertainties. People you know, are ambivalent about their decision. You pick up oftentimes abuse issues. You offer supports in the, in the community. So if somebody's in an abusive relationship, you give them information about resources available. And so counseling is like the key to getting an abortion. It, you have to make sure it's the woman's choice, not somebody else forcing her or coercing her. You have to make sure it's absolutely what she wants. It's irreversible. It's a very difficult thing for a woman to go through. Absolutely. Uh, you guide a lot of women through this process. Can you give us any kind of a sense of your opinion of the emotional impact this may have had on this 12-year-old girl? Oh my goodness. I think the emotional impact of being abused alone is horrific, but then to have such an invasive procedure performed and to, you know, as she gets older, you know, to, to reflect on that and to, you know, realize how she came to be in that situation and to feel, I'm sure she feels let down by the system that was set up to protect her. It's still, for the vast majority of people, it's still a difficult decision to make because nobody ever wants to have an abortion. It's not on anybody's bucket list to do this. So even for the woman who's in here with no other issues going on, they're in loving partnership and they happen to find themselves with a non-planned pregnancy, even those women struggle. But I can't imagine the extra burden of knowing how you became impregnated and then at that young age having to undergo two abortions, uh, you know, having one is bad, having two is worse, you know, I would think mentally for that young woman. So. I'm sure she's going to need a lot of counseling. Do you feel the system let her down? Absolutely, I feel the system let her down. I, you know, again, I don't know the details of what happened at the hospital, but I feel somewhere along the way there might have been an opportunity to intervene and change this outcome for her. Rolanda Ryan, thank you very much for speaking with us about this. You're welcome, Caroline. Thank you. We've been bringing you stories about all the people finding cool ways to make money at Chase the Ace. Well, it doesn't get any cooler than homemade ice cream made somehow by this vintage tractor. We've got a real scoop coming up after the break.
Welcome back, and we are going back to the ghouls as thousands of people are gathering for the Chase the Ace draw, which is happening in about 90 minutes mm. from now. Yes, a lot of anxious people, uh, every one of them hoping to have their number called tonight for a chance to draw that elusive Ace of Spades. And it would bring an end to the nearly year-long lottery and, of course, leave them rich. Of course. Uh, <laughs> let's bring in uh, here now Zach Gowdy once again. He's outside St. Kevin's Parish tonight. Zach? Yes, so we've gone across the street and uh, you can see why. Gould's, of course, is famously a farming community and the local 4-H club have found a way to bring this piece of farming history into Chase the Ace. And for that story, I'm joined by uh, Jacqueline Poole, 4-H uh, club uh, volunteer and parent. Yes. So, uh, Jacqueline, I saw this on the street last week, and we literally stopped our van to get a closer look at it. You did, yeah. And I bet I'm not the first person to do that. No, you're not. There's, so, we've been drawing a little bit of attention. I'm just going to step to your other side. Will you please tell us about this amazing machine? Sure. This is a 1941 farm tractor, um, and this actual apparatus on the back is an ice cream maker that we picked up in Ohio. So it's an Amish. It was made in an Amish community, and we've, we had it shipped here. And we were privileged enough to be allowed to use it for this for this adventure. It's really amazing. And is the tractor actually powering the ice cream maker? Yes, yeah. So the, the ice cream maker is hooked up to the tractor and when we turn the crank the it spins and that's what makes the ice cream. All right, well yeah. let's 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 see this thing in action. So we're you've been lucky enough to provide us with some supplies here. Yeah. We got the secret recipe for ice cream. Please uh, let us know what we're doing as the chef okay, so uh, pours the ingredients. Gonna, you're, you're gonna pour the, all that in there. Uh, yeah, so first level we got six liters of homogenized milk yeah. the final labrador classic here we go what's next and then you're going to pour in some cream some Get heavy cream. cream so have you guys been getting good at this all the 4-h volunteers uh, now ex expert ice cream makers? oh yeah that's something i'm going to add to my resume for sure <laughs> <laughs> okay we'll do the cleanup later folks here we go in with the cream this is the most important ingredient it is now the next we're going to add in an amish mix okay now, secret ingredient so the amish the secret yeah, in yeah, this yeah. bag to themselves hey Okay, in go the secret herbs and spices. Oh. <laughs> there we go. These are sterile, right? They are, and yeah. uh, next, very important ingredient. Sugar. Sugar. Getting close. Two more to go. We've got vanilla. One of my ingredients. The last, I've all stuff really to her. This is condensed milk. Yeah. Did an ice cream and also donair sauce. Oh, donair sauce? Yes, yeah, this is the oh. secret ingredient of okay. donair sauce. Okay, locked and loaded. Let's get this thing churning. Now we're going to put the cover on here. Nice. Okay. Snap down these gears. you got a pretty elaborate leather belt system. Yeah, I think we're going to get the leather belt reattached here. The old school wooden buckets just to add to the experience. That's right, yeah. So what are people saying to you as they come up to taste this fabulous ice cream? Everybody has liked it so far. We haven't had anybody yet that said they they weren't impressed, so we've been receiving some very good feedback. And of course, yeah. uh, you guys started this uh, just behind the, the ice cream maker. You're running a parking lot here also for right. Chase the Ace. Yes. Yeah. So we've, uh, we're a local 4-H group based here in the Goulds, and we're taking 31 children uh, from the Goulds and this area to Toronto in the fall to the Royal Agricultural Fair. You know, it's really amazing uh, how many other groups have been able to find, you know, um, something for themselves, and you can imagine how much... Uh, how hard it would be to raise the money you need for that trip without this Chase the X. That's right, definitely. It's been a wonderful, a wonderful thing for us. It's taken quite a bit, a bit of our time, but it certainly had huge payoff. Just before I let you go, there we go. Thank you so much, Greg. All right, we've got a, we got a real scoop for the crowd here, folks. I don't know about the Chase the Ace drive. This is the real money shot. Mm. I know we're on TV, but that's the best ice cream I've ever had. There you go. Thank you I so much. I lie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in the neighborhood, folks, I hope you get to try some of this of your own. And we'll be back uh, one more time a little later on here and now. You guys, uh, just leave me alone for like 20 minutes or something. <laughs> hey, i got to finish this. Will do, Zach. Enjoy. <laughs> Well, coming up next, we have more on our, on our top story, the sexual abuse of a 12-year-old girl whose case exposes many gaps in our healthcare system.
and welcome back to Here and Now. Earlier today, the provincial advocate for children and youth released a disturbing report into the case of a girl who was repeatedly sexually assaulted by her stepfather. At the age of 12, she became pregnant and her stepfather took her to Eastern Health for an abortion. Once it was done, they walked out together and no one said or did anything to raise an alarm. Here's some of what the advocate had to say at her press conference. In this particular case, the stepfather brought the child in for the abortion. Uh, the consents weren't appropriately completed. Uh, the appropriate screening was not done. And the appropriate pre and post supports and counseling were not provided to her. And then she, she left the hospital with him. So, you know, we had a situation here where there was child sexual abuse going on within a family. And the child left a formal health care system with the person who had abused her. So there were, there were so many gaps there in terms of the response. I think there were significant um, pieces of information that were missed. Uh, assessments weren't completed, screening wasn't done, supports and follow-up weren't provided, consents weren't uh, in place appropriately, um, and the professionals involved were not aware of the relevant legislation. So if you define that as failure, I think there's probably a failure. We had a little 12-year-old 12 12-year-old girl who was coming in with a man who she thought was her father, um, and she was pregnant. Um, that in itself is an anomaly. That's not an everyday occurrence. When you look at the gendered nature of sexual abuse and sexual offenses, uh, little girls are much more vulnerable to that in that age group. And so, you know, just knowing some of that basic information might have been enough of a warning sign for them to say, you know, we really need to call in someone on this case. So we have had some really nice weather, yep. but it's going to take a little bit of a turn. Well, here Ridley. in St. John's, we got another nice one tomorrow. And in fact, I'm thinking even most of Friday, at least Friday morning, will likely remain dry. But yeah, it's slowly pushing eastward, and I mean slowly. Uh, Western Newfoundland into the rain today. A couple of showers in central, uh, but central really into the mix tomorrow. And again, there's the low off to the left-hand side of your screen. We'll back things out, and this front extends all the way down from Western Newfoundland right down into the southeast parts of the U.S. And a new low will develop along this front, and that is what will bring in some rain to eastern Newfoundland Friday, especially Friday night into Saturday. Here is how it all plays out in terms of your timeline. Picking up the future tracker this evening, again, steadiest rains over western Newfoundland, the northern peninsula, and across most of the big land. Note that heaviest rain across Labrador moves off to the north. Still some scattered shower chances right through the day tomorrow. Nain back to Labrador City. A dry start, Happy Valley Goose Bay in the southeast. The rain in the morning in the west parts of Newfoundland. That pushes in through central into the afternoon with some uh, sunny breaks developing for the northern peninsula and western Newfoundland. Uh, things cloud up and turn showery for southeastern Labrador. The dry spot from start to finish tomorrow will once again be the Avalon, the Buren, Bonavista, Vista and out towards the uh, Clarenville region, really looking nice. Uh, we are going to be seeing temperatures again, 25, 26 degrees, feeling into the low 30s with the humid X. So again, a bit of a mugginess in the air once again for tomorrow. Just 12 in Labrador City tomorrow. Happy Valley Goose Bay will hit 20, but then it's a temperature drop for you folks as we move into Friday as winds punch in from the north on the other side of the system. Note as we roll throughout the day on Friday, that steadiest rain again working into eastern Newfoundland and St. John's where things will be damp. Temperatures in the 20 to 22 degree range back down to 14. In fact, most of Labrador in those low to mid teens on Friday. Uh, the West Coast not looking too bad. 22 in Cornerbrook, a little bit uh, cooler with uh, mid to high teens for the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador. By the time we get through till Saturday morning, again, we're looking at a widespread uh, potential here for 20 to 30 millimeters of rainfall across a good portion of the island. Uh, some steadier rains possible along that south coast, especially Burgio to Ramia, where we have rainfall warnings in effect uh, with upwards of 50 millimeters by the end of the day tomorrow. Here is how we will play out for Friday evening into the overnight. There's our new low coming in for Saturday. Uh, periods of rain, I think, on the menu for Saturday morning, and then it's a clear out into the afternoon with scattered shower chances. The biggest thing that will be happening on Saturday is the winds will shift to north, and so I actually think temperatures will fall in eastern Newfoundland into the afternoon. Same thing with central and the northeast coast. Uh, 
again, scattered shower chances will pretty much linger for most of the day on Saturday. So while I think our high will be 17 to start, we're closer to Grand Falls, Windsor and Gander numbers here in Metro by the time we get to the afternoon. 17 in Cornerbrook, some scattered shower chances there as well. Labrador starting to clear it a little bit earlier. And as I roll through into your seven day trend, you can see where we have uh, Sunday, Monday, certainly drier, uh, but that southeast flow still looks like it's going to be on the menu for Sunday into Monday. That's why temperatures will be cool. Even an onshore flow ling lingering into Tuesday system for Wednesday. So yeah, a bit of a hiccup there for late weekend into early next week, but it looks like a southwest wind will return late next week. So uh, it's not all done. And of course, the long weekend is uh, next weekend. So we're keeping a close eye on that. There's your forecast for Labrador really improving through the weekend. Time now to meet our young athlete of the day who comes to us from Whitless Bay. Madeline Walsh is super active at just three years old. <laughs> Madeline participates in pre-ballet, gymnastics, and under four soccer. Way to go, Madeline. You're today's young athlete of the day. When we come back, the story of a Newfoundland man who uses parody to cheer up his friends and neighbors in Fort McMurray. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. <laughs> a Newfoundlander who's teaching in Fort Mac is using humorous videos to help recover from that massive wildfire that, of course, destroyed the community. Yes, 37-year-old Keith Muse is from Stephenville, but now lives in Alberta. He creates skits and parodies using popular songs from the 1980s and then posts them online. Yeah, he says his goal is to flood Fort McMurray uh, with content that makes people laugh, Here's an example. Now this is the tale all about why after finishing school in PEI, it'll only take a minute and my memory is blurry. This is how I became the prince of a town called McMurray. In West Stephenville, I was born and raised on the Tendos is where I spend most of my days. I was a thriller like Jackson, and I was so cool, yo, playing some hopscotch outside the school. A couple of times, I was up to no good, driving people crazy in my neighborhood. 
My future didn't look bright, my mom was sick with worry She said, you're moving with your uncle up to McMurray I called for a cab, they sent me a van We didn't have them like that back in Newfoundland I asked them to speed, cause I was in a hurry I said, now nah, yo, forget it, yo, home's to McMurray And I pulled up to a house in Thickwood Heights All my buddies were there and they all worked on site I was feeling so hungry that I ate a McFlurry Gonna work in the sands on the Prince of McMurray His seat dancing is hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for the earworm, Keith. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I would have loved to say thank you face to face to face to everybody somehow. I did not. Their 2016 tour captured the heart of a nation. Now, tragically hip fans can get an exclusive intimate look into their world in a new documentary, Long Time Running. The documentary chronicles the band's emotional tour with frontman Gord Downey, who's battling inoperable brain cancer. The documentary is set to premiere next month at the Toronto International Film Festival. Gord Downey's brain tumor. Quick recap on your weather forecast over the next three days. Again, tomorrow, enjoy it in the east. We will cloud up. We'll bring some showers in for Friday. Saturday, temperatures will fall. We'll start near 17 uh, in St. John's, but I think we're more like 14 to 13 into the afternoon, although the rain will start to ease off through the day as well. Uh, Got to let you know that the squids are in at Spitten Cove White Bay. And this uh, courtesy of uh, Beverly, uh, who uh, says, uh, yeah, the squid season is on there. So well, just look at them. I've never seen them up close, you know, from a boat like that. Yeah. Wow. Something. Thanks, Beverly. Everybody on my Facebook page commenting, how can I get some? <laughs> <laughs> that I cannot answer. Splitten Cove. Yeah. Hmm. Nice. Alrighty, we are just about ready to leave you, but let's give the last word to Zach Gowdy, who is, you know where, out in the ghouls. Yes, uh, there, there's just one hour away now from uh, the Chase Ace draw, and thousands of people are waiting on this, and he's joining us live. So, Zach, is it a nervous crowd at this point? 
I think it's more of a relaxed crowd. You know, I, I've said this before, but it bears saying again, it really is a carnival atmosphere out here, just like a summer festival. Um, if you can look out on the big field, you'll see there are people uh, who've brought lawn chairs. Uh, of course, the nature of the game, in order to win, you have to be here at draw time. So this is the time of day uh, when many of the people who bought tickets throughout the morning and afternoon now pile back into the Goulds or filter back down to St. Kevin's if they've been somewhere else today, and they just hang out and wait. You can hear there's some music playing. Uh, plenty of people have brought refreshments. In fact, I think the people may be doing it best are the tailgaters uh, among the RV camping group. Uh, so that's another way to measure the growing success of this event. I've been counting the number of RVs here at the St. Kevin's parking lots as the weeks have gone on. Started with maybe two, the next week four, the next week six. Today, 16 RVs camping out here at St. Kevin's. Many people said they got in here a day or two ago just to get their spots. Uh, they're having a great time. I'm not sure if you can see Santa Claus uh, down in the crowd, <laughs> but that's the sort of uh, atmosphere that we have, the kind of fun-loving spirit that people who come out to play Chase the Ace have embraced. We're going to leave you folks with a shot of the crowd. Remember, if you cannot be here yourself and you don't want to miss the big moment, join us on Facebook. That is the CBCNL Facebook page. We're going to start broadcasting at around 8 p.m. just when they stop selling tickets. And a few minutes after that, it's game time. Hope you can join us. I'm Zach Gowdy, live from the Goulds. Thanks for watching here and now.